The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. This is Sandy Abrams. Welcome to the OPI Power Hour. We're going to get started here in just a moment. I want to remind you that if you have any questions or comments or ideas, please go ahead and type them into the questions section, and that way I will be able to see it um, and respond. Sorry, the handouts are not inside this presentation. Um, I will email them out to the attendees list. Um, those of you who've registered since late morning when I sent them out. Um, and we will have them posted. We're recording this session. And we will have them posted with this um, recorded webinar. So today, we're really going to focus on the ADLs and the changes that have occurred. We're also going to go over the recent um, information memorandums uh, as well as some more about interviewing and having these conversations regarding the assessment with our consumers. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. First, we're going to talk about documenting these ADL needs. Um, you know, when you read what the comments are in supporting your decision in the assessment of whether this person is independent or a full assist or any level in between those, I would encourage you to really look at telling the why and the how frequent and the how the assistance is being received. Put the story in there. I don't mean to like write a novel, but you sure need to show how you came to this determination. Here's an example, as well as an example of what can be written. So here, for example, is one regarding an IADL. The prior one was an ADL. And just as important, tell us about the story of the, of the IADL. What is needed there? You can tell here in the example, I have used the term, um, would like to hire a housekeeper because he dislikes housekeeping so much. How it was tidy, what it looked like. And that helps really limit um, or allow you to help tailor your plan so that it's not 10 hours of housekeeping um, for a studio apartment, for example. Why would that be necessary? If it's primarily in laundry, we would put that there. Just a, a quick reminder of what are the assist types now with the rule transition um, and what they mean. So when you use these terms in relationship to your assessment, it's really important that you know the definition being used by APD for these words. Though our our regular speak may mean something different, our living room talk, if you will. This is when we use these terms, this is what they mean. And you as the case manager, service coordinator, need to be using these terms with these definitions in this context. You know, when we're having that conversation and our our assessments are so intimate and personal. Remember that we really are focusing upon open-ended questions because we need to get the consumer, um, and if they're unable to communicate, their caregiver, to answer all of this information. So the who, the what, the how, the why, the when, the where, and the frequency. Use your terminology that the consumer understands. 
Um, here are some examples of starters. And always clarify the question. Um, I like to, if I don't get it, or if I'm still not clear to the point where when I read the question that I'm going to have to respond to, I use the term, help me understand. We really want to avoid using the jargon um, that we have in the assessment tool and how we get there. But yet we must stay true to applying the, the rules and the guidelines there. So if they say, I always need help to get outside, and you notice that it's an easy step in walkway, there's not a step, um, there's no impediments, if you will, ask more about it so that you can understand that. Again, it's based upon your observations and the information you're putting in that we're giving them the Oregon Project Independence Program and spending our taxpayer dollars. So we really need to stand true to these definitions. Make sure to use all of your senses. You know, look around the environment. What's this house like? What's this apartment, this mobile home, this travel trailer look like? Does it smell? Is there food? Was it hard for you to get in and out of the couch? Then how does the consumer do that? Are you noticing wet spots? Um, I really want to encourage you to trust your gut. You know, when you're standing there talking to someone, um, sitting down, chatting with them, and you just get a sense that something is off, please go ahead and, you know, follow that up. You know best. So keep an eye on the consumer and everything that is happening in the room. And follow up outside of that if you need to. Again, I want to encourage you to send me any questions you may be having or any um, comments you may have. When you see conflicting information, such as the consumer says, I can clean my house on my own, but you're sitting there and it's in disarray, I want to encourage you to really follow up on what is the incongruency. What conflicts with this person's statement? I am, you know, I remember interviewing a gentleman and he was wearing very soiled clothing, um, specifically his pants. You could see that he had wet himself. It had dried perhaps a couple of times over. There was a staining on the backside. And he said that he had no problems with any kind of going to the bathroom issues. You know, following it up. It appears that your clothes are soiled. Are you having a hard time changing your clothes? Are you having a hard time getting to the bathroom in time? It happens for a lot of folks. That kind of follow through in conversation. We also really want to pay attention to safety issues, such as are they smoking? Do they use oxygen? Do they have lots of throw rugs that are tripping hazards or small pets that could be tripping hazards? What is their ability to exit? Can they get to safety? Um, is there a fire hazard? If they live in a zone, an area where there might be a fire hazard, a tsunami zone, um, wildfire, for example, what is their plan for getting out of there? Do they have natural supports that maybe are individuals who could be endangering this person? Look in and have conversations about that. Do you feel safe here in your home when your son is here? Some of those kinds of issues.
So now we're really going to spend a little bit of time, and I'm probably going to go through this fairly quickly because I think our handouts have been pretty good, and I'm going to rely upon you asking me questions to go back and to further clarify any areas you don't un understand. We're not going to go into cognition today. We did that during the November Power Hour. So if you need cognition, go pick up and listen to the Power Hour from November 29th. Mobility. Just a reminder that for mobility, we need to really check in on, is this regarding getting around inside their home, outside their home, how frequently this occurs? They need to have hands-on help from another person and being real specific about what it does not include, such as getting in and out of a vehicle, getting in and out of the bathtub or the shower. Ambulation also does not include any form of exercise or physical therapy. So for example, if we're paying the home care worker to take them for a walk outside, if that's exercise it's not that they're going out to get the mail from the mailbox down the driveway then we aren't really able to be paying for that time now if it's because they cognitively would get lost then that time and that task would be more specific to cognition One of the major changes that occurred with ambulation in the October changes is moving from monthly to weekly. So now we're really specifically asking our questions about hands-on assistance that's occurring weekly. The other point is that this now includes getting to and from the toileting area. No longer is that part of a elimination in toileting. Notice the bullet that says an individual who is confined to bed is a full assist in ambulation. You know, a history of falls and the inability to get up without another person's assistance is important, but I is not going to dictate, if you will, the need for hands-on assistance. So, Mobility is not solely dependent upon the history of falls. I'm kind of bringing up this question of what is the most appropriate answer? Think of it in that way. What's most appropriate? Is it this or that or always full assist? Now notice that a B requires hands-on assistance from another person to ambulate. Now this is what we call minimal assist, and it occurs outside the home or care setting, at least one day each week, totaling four days a month, or inside their home or care setting, less than one day each week. So catch that that's new. That last part, the inside their home or care setting, that is less than one day each week. Transfers. This is still all about how does a person move from one place to another place, such as bed to chair, chair to bed, toileting areas, wheelchairs, and it is specifically related to how much help are they getting from another person, not the tools and apparatuses and assistive devices around them. Then if they're able to use those effectively, um, they're independent. But if they need a person to place the tool, to assist along the way, that's where you would be looking at how much help and what do you do when they are not available to do those things.
it is in the area of transfers that we would assess for individuals who need help to reposition, whether they're in their bed, their chair, or their wheelchair. And again, this now also encompasses getting on and off the commode or toilet. For the toileting area, we used to have that under toileting. It has now moved over here to transfers. But again, what it does not include, getting in and out of a car or a truck or a motor vehicle. It does not include getting in and out of the bathtub or the bath chair, those sorts of things. Eating. We've had very significant changes in the field of eating. So I really would like you to reread the questions and become um, refreshed with it, if you will. It's not as it once was. <laughs> so if you were most familiar with the prior definition, um, really work on um, ingesting, if you will, a pun intended there, um, the eating section. And some of the questions we're being asked now to do that. Remember that cutting that food and bringing it to the table or to their eating area is not to be considered here in eating. That's in meal prep. Eating really has all to do about how do they consume this food, chewing on it, swallowing it, um, and how much help do they need. There's been some specific clarifications in the new rule, such as within sight and immediately available. That really has moved to a definition that makes a lot more sense, I think. It truly means someone has to be able to actively provide hands-on help to them, um, to help them clear their airway, to feed them, or to step in. So it's not that the caregiver can be in the kitchen while the person's sitting at the table in the adjoining room. It needs to be immediately available. Um, the whole issue regarding choking has gotten some clarity there. And our definition for an assist means that the family, the provider, has to be physically able to assist the individual who is choking. So here's some tips, some ideas to use when maybe in the past you have incorrected, incorrectively <laughs> um, applied this rule. Start thinking about why does this consumer need assistance in order to complete the activity. Um, it's always helpful, particularly folks who have a lot of fatigue and may be gravely ill. You know, maybe they can only do 10% of their um, feeding themselves, and after that, they must be fed. That is very clear. I think it's very understandable when we all read that and would get what that picture means. You know, does the need for this assistance occur each and every time and throughout the meal? Um, or does it fluctuate? And if so, describe why. Perhaps it is, you know, after week, twice a week um, dialysis sessions, so weak they can't even lift the glass to their lips to take a drink or needs assistance due to um, severity of the, of the tremors that occur um, at least weekly and more often. Um, those sorts and being as specific as you can with time frames um, and whom you have discovered this information from. I'm hoping that these tips and pointers can help you dig through some of this. Here's a few more comments about um, ideas and tips on this.
And here is the actual definition that comes out of Oregon Access. Um, remember that independent just means that they don't meet the criteria. That doesn't mean they're truly independent. Maybe their frequency is only every other week or once a month. They don't meet the specific criteria then being at least one day each week, totaling four days per month. Um, they still have a need, but it doesn't rise to our level. So independent sometimes is going to be a little bit of that, like I was saying earlier, the we're speaking DHS. <laughs> we're not speaking plain speak or, or living room speak. So make sure that you're putting that kind of comment in there. Notice that I've tried to highlight here, um, put in all caps, the assist types, the hands-on, the setup, the queuing. Elimination. Um, there's been some significant changes in the area of elimination with the new rules. We see that not only did we go to the clarity instead of once a month, we also clarified that now this is at least one day per week, four days per month. We also have eliminated some areas such as cleansing around the toileting area has moved to housekeeping um, and very specific definitions within bladder and bowel. So let's take a closer look at that. In the past, the rule was not specific about saying that it was to be considered only in their home or care setting. It now does. So this cannot be when they go to church or go to Walmart or go to their daughter's home. It's only within their home or their care setting. Changing of the incontinency um, soiled garments and and um, products is now going to be assessed in toileting, not in the area of bowel or the utter area of bladder. And remembering that we've removed the on and off and up to and from getting to the toileting area from toileting over to mobility. Bladder now specifically applies to only catheter care and ostomy care. If it's any other aspect of this, you'll see it does not apply. So this person might need assistance with their catheter, such as checking the bag for fullness, emptying the bag, um, cleaning, um, changing that bag, that sort of thing. Some tips on bladder. Notice this is the task of preventing incontinence. We're not going to be looking at that in this particular area. We'll look at that over in toileting. So that very last sentence, please keep in mind that if an individual does not have a catheter or an ostomy, they would be considered independent in bladder. Now, when you do have people who have the catheters and the ostomies, just a reminder, I threw in this word, treatments. Um, I know that you don't often use your treatments fields, or some of you may not. I think it's important to go ahead and make sure that you're having the treatment associated with those activities put in. And we'll be talking um, probably next month more about treatments and how to add them and how to define them. Bowel. Real specific definition, again, um, it's been narrowed 
So now we're talking about digital stimulation, suppository insertions, ostomy care, and enemas. Real specific. So that sort of thing, when the individual talks about this and it's, you know, they need assistance with the suppositories and it's, I don't know, I, I need one every now and then. Uh, remember that we're looking for assistance at least one day, one time, each week, totaling four days a month. And so you're really looking at that consistent need. So what's not there anymore is the toileting schedule or the changing of the incontinency supplies. So, for example, um, make sure that you're looking at how much help do they need with each task associated with the care need and helping the consumer and their caregiver, if they're involved in the assessment, break that apart for you. Um, again, reminding you that this window, this threshold of time that we're looking in for all of these activities of daily living and the instrumental activities of daily living are the 30 days past and the 30 days forward, um, as much as we see that there's that consistency there. Again, don't forget, as you're talking with people who have these a need in one of these four specific bowel areas to bring up and have the conversation regarding treatments and to include those into your assessment. Moving on then to toileting. Toileting again is a hands-on. Um, we can assist then with cueing um, to help prevent. So see that definition for toileting has changed. That's part of this October changes. Our frequency is still consistent. We're still talking one day a week, four days a month. Make sure that in the past where we have put in regarding mobility assistance to get to and from and on and off the toilet, that if that used to be considered there, that you've moved that need over into the area of mobility, specifically with ambulation and transfers. The need for assistance in changing the soiled incontinency supplies or soiled clothing um, is now here in toileting. So we're really wanting to look at including in your comments what that is and what those needs are. It used to be considered under the specific areas of bowel and bladder. Any questions so far? I just want to give us a quick pause here and check in with you and see we're about a half an hour into the presentation and I'm not seeing any questions come up well let's move on then into bathing and personal hygiene so we what we just finished it are really the, the three driving ADLs and then the one we covered last month with cognition. Those are the primary areas that are going to affect a person's service priority level. Um, bathing and personal hygiene, um, they don't really drive those indicators except for in the higher numbers of our um, service priority level. I just want to show you this. This was included in your handouts. And you can see it's just an updated listing, if you will, of the new service priority rules and the definitions for those. Um, 
and here you can see bathing and dressing um, and in grooming and personal hygiene those fit here under a 1617 so just helping you kind of sort this all out here the other piece that I gave you as an attachment or a handout today is this regarding the um, ADL levels and what do they mean what is a minimum what is a full assist um, as well as then sorry it's sideways but as you can see it's a continuous piece here um, what areas what types of assists you can utilize there so um, hoping that this gives you oh backwards let's try that again There we go. So here you can see specifically, these are the only assist types we're seeking that matter in our definitions and how we apply them um, for these various areas, including the areas of cognition. Um, hopefully this is a handy tool for you to reference. Okay. No questions yet, so we're moving on into bathing and personal hygiene. Now, I really want to point out here that there is a very dominant with these next two screens when we look at it, there is a dominant area that we look at in the activity. And for this combination, it's bathing. You have to have an assistance in bathing or a full assistance in hygiene to be considered assist. To be considered a full assist, it's only when they have a full assistance in bathing. So notice that that means a person who is independent in bathing and just an assist in hygiene, they aren't going to show in the hours that would be allowed for the service plan. It's going to show as a need, but it won't show over in the service plan area. So for bathing, the minimum frequency is again one day a week. Perhaps they choose to only bathe um, every other week, but if offered, they might consider it. It doesn't mean that they have to agree to that, but I would certainly be asking the question, you know, what do you do in between those times? I know that this was one of the big questions when we were talking about these changes coming, specifically for our OPI consumers who may have a very limited capacity to services. Um, remember that if they're giving themselves just a, a washcloth bath with the help of their family member um, to be able to have access to a full bath every other week, um, they still are getting assistance from another person. So keeping that, that change of one day per week. So the place in the verbiage that show on the assist types here really has to do with frequency. Um, there hasn't been any other changes to that. Now, personal hygiene. Of course, this means shaving, caring for the mouth, and assistance with menstrual care. And again, specifically, we're looking at areas where an individual would need hands-on assistance, cueing, or standby presence during that activity. This isn't set up. So it's not 
John remembers to shave when we have his razor sitting there on the bathroom counter. That's nice, but that's not rising to the level where we can address it in the service plan and pay a caregiver for setting that up. Dressing and grooming. So the dominant activity of this combination is dressing. Because when we look at what is defined as an assist, the individual must require assistance in dressing or a full assistance in grooming. To be considered full assist, they must require full assistance in dressing. Now, they may also have an assist in grooming or a full assist in grooming, but to get full assist in this category, they must have the area of a full assist in dressing. Again, the key factor that has changed here is the frequency. We're talking one day per week. Dressing includes the task of putting on and taking off clothing, shoes, and socks. So that helped clarify some of this. Gave some examples um, here about assessing the task of dressing and what has changed there. That you're really looking at those various tasks. And what is the definition by rule of a dressing assist and a full assist? Grooming. I've had probably more calls about grooming since the rule change in October than, well, that and cognition, believe it or not. Um, so here, grooming again, of course, means components of nail care and hair care. The frequency changed. Again, we're talking one day a week, four days per month. If in the past, what you've been able to do is to have someone have grooming for their toenails, let's say, and that happens because you have maybe a contractor come out one time a month and you give them X number of hours to do this activity. You just have to be clear about what is the need. Um, would this person accept weekly? Does it need to be done weekly? Can they do it? Do they have any other means of being able to do that? And, you know, really helping to um, discover what the true need here is and have this individual clarify for you um, the frequency there. Now, if you're contract with your in-home care agency is to do toenail care, that it has to be done in two-hour segments and this and that, that's really developed within your contract. But when we look at need, you're going to see that to have it show up, and, and that's why I have this slide in here, they have to show as a full assist in grooming if they are um, independent in dressing. They have to move to a full assistance in grooming so you can get that assist. Because if all you have is an assist in grooming, maybe they're able to do their own hair care. Well, if they're independent in that section, but need assistance with just their toenail care, it doesn't really fit our definition of what is a full assist. And that's gonna be really critical 
um, what we may have to do is not be allowing for toenail trimming if they don't have other needs in this dressing grooming area. And that's really hard to say to our consumers because I know that they've developed a relationship with us where we want to support them in their independence. And this will mean them needing to seek out services to assist them with their toenail care through other methods and other venues. Let me know if you have any questions about this. We're going to move now into the instrumental activities. So we will also see instrumental activities of daily living referred to at times as self-management tasks. Um, again, here in Oregon, with the service priority level rules, um, we are only looking at these components of housekeeping, which would include laundry, shopping, transportation, med management, and meal prep. We will see, like in the NAPAS information you may be assisting with for other programs that you work with, other questions regarding instrumental activities of daily living, but they are not the ones adopted by Oregon. We really want to base our determination of need on what is actual or what is um, predicated on the need of this individual. We need to not look at just what is supplied. So let's say they live with their daughter and son-in-law and the meals are prepared for them. That doesn't mean they can't cook. And we need to really look at what is their meal prep capacity um, and have that conversation. So you're going to see in all of these that we look at an individual's need for health and safety. So in housekeeping, this isn't about just the way we always have done it, is we dusted weekly. And to dust my home, that takes an hour. Um, we're really looking at health and safety, and perhaps a full hour is not, um, maybe it's too much per week to do housekeeping, especially with our limited service plans. We do want to look at the activities, if you will, such as wiping the surfaces um, that the individual uses in the home, cleaning the floors, both vacuuming and mopping and sweeping, um, making and changing the bedding, dishes and that kind of cleaning in the kitchen area, taking out of the trash, um, as well as this dusting. Now, what doesn't it include in housekeeping, of course, is things like pet care and home repair. And we really, no matter who all they live with, like in my example of the consumer lives with their daughter and son-in-law, um, we can only do housekeeping that is specifically related to the individual that we're serving. So it's their bedroom, maybe the area around where they sleep but our caregivers are not going in the home to become the family housekeeper. The other change that occurred here um, is we removed from toileting the aspect of emptying the commode and cleaning excessive um, soiling around a toileting area. That's now part of housekeeping. So this commode or urinal emptying is not captured any longer in elimination in toileting. It's now captured here in housekeeping. Laundry, nothing here has really changed other than the consideration of frequencies that we're talking weekly. And of course, in service planning, all of our laundry needs have included going over um, and work in our housekeeping area. Meal prep. We assess each of our meals separately, but it's also important to remember 
Notice over here under section B that when we're assessing individuals, dinner supper is always given the greatest number of, of hours, if you will, during a month. And that has to do with the nature of it being the largest meal and probably takes more time to prepare. So this really has to do with the fact of what is their main meal. And whatever is their main meal, we want to use that for dinner supper hours. So when you're doing your assessment, and let's say it's breakfast is their main meal, then you want to put your breakfast meal prep and information under dinner supper and make note of this. You know, though noted in dinner supper, this is really for breakfast prep as it is their main meal. For an individual who receives um, nutrition through their tube feeding, that should be addressed only under eating, but not in meal prep. And if you have questions regarding that, I'd be glad to entertain those. So in these areas, when we get into the CAPS, we do have this variety of assist levels because it's directly related to how hours are given. And so here are those definitions for you. Um, minimal assist means that the individual is able to perform the majority of the activity, whereas substantial, they can only do a small portion. So you're really kind of weighing out what all is the task related to um, and what do they need to do to accomplish that task. Med management, nothing here has changed other than frequency. Shopping, again, nothing here has really changed. And then transportation, lastly. This is where we're going to capture the individual getting in or out of the vehicle, getting to and from that vehicle. And then lastly, just the list of service priority rules. So let's, in our last few moments here, um, take a look at the transmittals that I sent out earlier this week. I think I did that on Monday. And the transmittal that I want us to specifically look at is the IM1790. This had to do with some changes to Oregon Access and to the service planning section that became available um, on Monday the 18th. So what changed was something that had previously occurred in the on-go system. Um, it's easier to make changes to the mainframe section to on-go than it is, for example, to the Oregon Access section. So this has now caught up, if you will, with the on-go change. So for example, um, we have our valid until date on reviews that are currently coming up and due is 1231 of 17. But we have our pay period that runs from 1225 to January 6th. So the system will automatically on the on-go side, when you have a valid assessment, for the 25th through the 31st, it is allowing the ONGO system to issue the voucher. What this 
I am is now, excuse me, um, yeah, I am is now telling you it is an information memorandum, is what we now need to do for that. So you can go into your prior assessment and create a line item, as you see here, for that time period that is not otherwise covered. So our prior service plan might have been 1-1 one, one of 17 to 12-31 of 17. You can go in and create a line item now of 1-1 one, one of 18 through 1-6 of 18. Then when you do your new assessment, you can set that up. So it's going to be for 1-7 of 18, and it will autofill what your end date is then for the last January payment allowed for the one year time. We still want to put into our service plans um, adult day services and in home. Um, home delivered meals, those are still set up by uh, the regular manner. Those are monthly, if you will, but they still have to fit with our new 14 day pay period, but they're gonna be ongoing. So that's just a real quick look at this. Oh, okay, I'm seeing, is this something that we are going to need to do for all of the home care workers who are currently providing services? Um, great question. It is currently, if you aren't updating your caps prior to the date, so let's look at right now, if you haven't gotten your reviews for December done by 1215, you will need to be doing this because the system will do it on your behalf. And now you're going to have to track behind it to show in Oregon Access that you're approving for this service to go from the 25th to the 6th of January in my example that I'm using. I hope that answered your question. Let me know. So another question, not really clear on how this, um, could I explain this again? Um, does that just mean the end date for the service plan was not jiving with the end date of the pay period? Um, yes, that, that's pretty much true. And what they've done is made it so that it's less of a um, burden, if you will. I mean, I think that honestly was the intent is that if you can't get out there by X date, then here is the other means of getting this done. So you can go in and, and create this because over on OnGo, they've already done it. And now you're just following through and completing it over here um, and showing it in Oregon Access. So in the old service plan, that you are updating with the new assessment you're going to put in for this period of time that's being covered. Certainly, I think the ideal is, is try to get it done before the, the um, approval deadline, which we have listed on the one of the calendars that I've sent out to you. So for example, we've already missed the deadline for December, and now we have a January deadline of the 11th. The 11th of January is the deadline for um, reviews that are due January 31st. Um, and then it's February 9th for those due by the 28th of February. So those we know are really early in the month and this is just a way that the system has come up with, the, the people here at central office have come up with to help intervene with that. So the question is, we look at the calendar um, and if the service plan end date falls in the middle of a two week pay period um, and 
the end date would be the last day of the pay period, not the service plan's original end date. That's correct. We are as we move through the 2017-18 year and we have this two-week issue implemented, we will see our begin and end dates move to jiving with the pay period time. When I did over in the training um, Oregon Access, and I, I just did a sample of this, it auto-filled the end date for me. So that if I said I was starting this on December 12th, it went ahead and said then your last pay period will be in 2018 on December 22nd. So it, it that was one of the improvements they've made with this update. And again, the IM that I'm looking at, the information memorandum is 1790. Um, I think it's pretty clearly written. I'm giving us even an example here of the dates and how they would work. Okay, well, I believe this is the end of the power hour. I'm going to stay online and answer any other questions that you all might have. I'm aware that we do have another call that some of you want to be getting on to. So um, I want to get us done in time so that you can do that. We are moving the time and dates or day of the week that we do this call in 2018. We're going to be alternating months of doing the call and doing an open line conference call for questions and comments and conversation with other OPI case managers every other month. And then every other month, we're going to have webinars. And the webinars really, really focused upon training and um, helping you with any policy things that are changing or software changes that are occurring. So thank you for attending today. And um, I'm hoping that you have a wonderful holiday. And let me know if you have any other questions. I'll be here on the line. I'm not seeing any other questions coming up. <laughs> ah, I see one. Um, Good question about whether there's changes to the fee determination and pay-in based on the 14-day pay period. Not yet, not yet. Um, that we will be looking at here in 2018. It will require the rule being opened up or us doing a temporary rule change. So we are not yet going to address that. We're just sticking with doing those for monthly and that the AAAs only are billing the consumers monthly. Good question. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and end this presentation then, and I want to thank you for your time and your attention today, and we will talk again next month. Thank you.